So this video is going to introduce the concept of polarization and how to predict reactions with uh, polarized orbitals. Uh, it forms part of our first year organic chemistry module and it builds on previous videos that I've done on molecular orbital theory. So if any other concepts like homos and lumos and so on seem a bit alien, then you might need to go back and watch the other videos. So in the previous video, we discussed what types of orbitals can act as homos and lumos. And we came up with this uh, system where your nucleophile homo is going to be one of three things and your electrophile lumo is going to be one of three things as well. Uh, the non-bonding examples, so the filled non-bonding lone pairs on the nucleophile or the empty non-bonding um, orbital on the electrophile are easy to predict because both of those orbitals are contained on a single atom. So it's clear where your arrow needs to start and your arrow needs to finish. So in this example here, we've got an amine nucleophile, which has a lone pair on nitrogen. And we've got a carbocation electrophile where we've got an empty p orbital on this carbon. So it's clear that our arrow needs to start on the nitrogen lone pair and point to the carbon where the positive charge is. And that gives us our product over here. And we can use this to predict uh, reactivity in several other systems. So if we have this um, carbonyl compound as our nucleophile and uh, boron trifluoride as our electrophile, um, all of the uh, elements that are in boron's column in the periodic table have got an empty p orbital on them. So they've got an empty non-bonding orbital. So it means that we can push the arrow directly from the oxygen lone pair onto boron and we end up with a product that looks like this. Similarly, if we go one row further down the periodic table, aluminium, aluminium is the same. So we can push our arrow directly from our negative charge or our lone pair onto aluminium and that gives us our product. So we know where our bond is going to form from and where it's going to form to. Now where we hit a problem is in these um, pi and sigma bonding orbitals as the homo and pi star and sigma star antibonding orbitals as a lumo because all of these orbitals cover two atoms so we need a way of predicting what's going to happen. So because they're shared between two atoms this is the issue that we've got. So I'm going to take methyl lithium as an example and HBr as an example electrophile. So which end of our uh, lumo gets attacked? So in this case we've got one of the lobes of the lumo is on hydrogen and one is on bromine so we could attack here or we could attack here. So which is it? And which atom from the HOMO does the new bond form to? So obviously this um, sigma bonding HOMO covers both carbon and lithium. So the new bond could form from carbon or it could form from lithium. And how do we predict that? Well, this is where electronegativity can help us out. So here's a periodic table that might look a bit strange, but this is what we call a Pauling electronegativity periodic table. So each of the values given for each of the elements is the Pauling electronegativity score. And the higher the score, the more electronegative your atom, your element is, your atom is. So more electronegative elements like having electrons. So the top right corner of the periodic table, fluorine is the most electronegative element we've got. These are atoms that really like having electrons. Um, and you can tell because they form reasonably stable anions. Conversely, uh, less electronegative or more electropositive elements um, don't mind giving away electrons. So they don't really have as much affinity for electrons as the elements up here. So we can use this imbalance um, to cause what's called polarization. And this is what's going to allow us to predict reactivity. So bond polarization. Let's use a simple example to start with. So dihydrogen and HBr. So in dihydrogen, the electronegativity of the two atoms that make up this bond are both the same. They're both 2.2. And that means that the electrons are shared equally. So our orbital looks like this. It's symmetrical. Um, as a result, our bond is non-polarized. Okay? So the, if the orbital coefficient is shared equally across both atoms, that is not a polarized bond. If we look at HBr, the electronegativity difference, um, well, there is an electronegativity difference. So bromine is 2.96, whereas hydrogen is only 2.2. So bromine is more electronegative than hydrogen, so it has more affinity for electrons. As a result, the electrons in this bond are shared unequally, and the bond is therefore polarized. So you can see the orbital coefficient is bigger on bromine than it is on hydrogen. Now, we normally express um, this as this is basically a, a bond having a permanent dipole moment and we normally express this either with this kind of arrow with a, a cross through it 
or I prefer to do it as delta positive and delta negative. Now these are not formal positive and negative charges, it just means a little bit positive and a little bit negative. It's just showing you where the polarization is in the bond. So back to our molecular orbital diagram, um, I showed you in a previous video how we assembled this. Um, if we look at dihydrogen, the sigma orbital that we we form, the sigma, sigma molecular orbital we form, has the same energy gap to both atomic orbitals that went into making it. So that tells you that this sigma orbital is equally shared between these two atoms. So this energy gap here is identical to this energy gap over here. So the sigma orbital is equally shared, and as a result it's symmetrical. The same is true of the sigma star antibonding orbital. It's got the same energy gap to this hydrogen as it has to this hydrogen over here. So because the energy gap's the same, the sigma star is equally shared, and therefore it's also symmetrical. Now, the more electronegative your element is, the lower in energy its atomic orbitals are. And we briefly covered this in the, in the previous video, but I didn't say anything about it. So if we change one of our hydrogens to bromine now, because bromine's more electronegative than hydrogen, its orbitals are lower in energy. So what we've now got is an imbalance in the energy gaps um, that go into making the, the corresponding molecular orbitals. So the sigma bonding orbital here is closer in energy to bromine than the hydrogen. So more of this sigma coefficient is present on bromine because it's closer in energy than it is on hydrogen. So our orbital looks like this, it's skewed towards bromine. Now the opposite is true of our sigma star antibonding orbital. It's closer in energy to hydrogen than it was to the bromine orbitals that went into making it. So the sigma star antibonding orbital has more orbital coefficient on hydrogen. So it's polarized kind of in the opposite direction, if you like. Now, the more electronegative your element, the lower in energy stomatic orbitals go. So this is moving from bromine to fluorine. You can see that the orbitals have got even lower in energy down, now, down here. So the energy gap has become um, even more different. So this is a very small gap now and a very large gap on this side. And you can see that the polarization uh, is reflected in that. So HF is a more polarized bond than HBr is. And if I just flick back, you can see the orbital shapes reflect that. Now, if you get orbitals uh, which are so far apart in energy, the energy gap becomes so large um, that the orbitals are basically almost exclusively on, on the, the component atoms. So the energy gap here between this lithium orbital and this uh, antibonding orbital and this fluorine orbital and this one is, is very small indeed. So your orbitals actually look more like this. And because there's hardly any sigma orbital density between the two atoms, um, the, putting electrons in that orbital won't hold them together. So you can't form a covalent bond between these atoms. So this is what we think of as ionic bonding. What you essentially get is transfer of an electron from one element to the other, so from the more electropositive to the more electronegative, to form an ionic bond. So these aren't held together by a covalent bond, like a sigma bond. These are held together by electrostatic attraction, because one of them is formally positive and one of them is formally negatively charged. So polarization solves our problem. If we take this uh, reaction here as an example, polarized sigma or pi bonding homos attack from the atom which has the largest homo coefficient, i.e. where the bonding orbital is the largest. And this is the most electronegative atom or the most delta negative. So if we look at sodium hydride as our nucleophile, the bonding orbital is um, polarized, it's skewed towards hydrogen because hydrogen is more electronegative than sodium. So you can think of this as delta positive, delta negative, if you like. So whenever we form a new bond to uh, the sodium hydride, the hydrogen is the one that's going to form the new sigma bond. Polarized sigma star or pi star lumos get attacked on the atom, which has the largest lumo coefficient. Now, if you remember on the previous diagrams, this is the least electronegative atom. The, the polarization is skewed in the opposite direction for antibonding orbitals. So this is the most delta positive. So if we look at our alcohol over here, then our antibonding orbital is skewed more towards hydrogen because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So therefore hydrogen is the more delta positive element in this case. So we now know where our bond's gonna form from and where it's gonna form to. So it's allowed us to predict reactivity. So our curly arrow goes like this. We're filling an antibonding orbital here. So we need to break the bond towards oxygen. And we know that our new sigma bond forms between hydrogen and hydrogen. So we form dihydrogen. 
Our sodium is left delta uh, not delta positive. Our sodium is left actually positive. This is formal positive charge because the share of the electrons in this sigma bond is now gone. Hydrogen's taken it and used it to form this sigma bond. So sodium ends up cationic. And oxygen ends up anionic because it's taken the pair of electrons from this sigma bond, which is broken. So it becomes electron rich. So we know how to predict reactivity if our HOMO or LUMO is polarized, but what if it's non-polarized? Well, in a lot of situations, it doesn't matter. So, for example, in dibromine, um, the LUMO is the Br2 sigma star orbital. Um, if both ends are equally reactive and both ends are the same, this is a homonuclear diatomic molecule. It doesn't matter if you attack this side to give you this product, or if you attack the other side, the product is the same. So it doesn't matter which is which. But if it does matter, um, for instance, predicting which of these two carbon atoms here is going to form the new bond to bromine, either this one or this one, then certain other things can help us to predict this. And this is where particularly carbocation stability comes in. So we can predict that given the choice of these two options, so either this carbon forming the bond to bromine or this carbon forming the bond to bromine, this is the one that's actually going to happen. And that's based on carbocation stability which is the subject of another video on my channel.